For question number one, you just replace the x in the function with a negative 3. So this is 3 times negative 3 squared minus 5. And if you just wrote that, I think I gave you partial credit. Right? I tried, on, when I was creating this exam, I tried to give you half credit for every question as often as I could. Um, so this last, I mean, that right there would have earned you half credit at least. Negative 3 squared is 9. 3 times 9 is 27, and then 27 minus 5 is 22. So question 1, your answer is 22. Um, the most common mistake I saw was people were saying that th ne you know, negative 3 squared was negative 9, and then you would end up with like a negative 32 as your answer. Or I saw several people say that 3 times 9 was 18, which is not exactly correct. So 3 times 9 is 27. Um, in the graph below, the curve represents a relation. And the question is, since not every relation is a function, is this a function? And the answer was no, it's not a function. But I asked you to explain why or why not, and I didn't give anybody credit without an explanation because whenever there's only two answer choices, it's very easy to guess, right? Uh, so really the credit came if you gave me a valid explanation. And a valid explanation might look something like the words like vertical line test. If you just wrote vertical line test, that gave you full credit. Um, because there's a few places here in this graph where if you had drawn a vertical line, the vertical line passes through it more than once. So that is not a function. Uh, so what's your name? Bonnie. Bonnie. Okay. In question number three, we have a curve. And I tell you it represents a function. And the question is, is it possible for this function to have an inverse? And we mentioned this in class. Only one-to-one -one functions can have an inverse. And the test to determine whether a function happened to be a one-to-one -one function was called the horizontal line test. And this function fails the horizontal line test because I can find a horizontal line that passes through the function more than once. And so the answer is no. There is no inverse that exists. And when you're asked to explain, in order to get credit for this question, you needed to say something like horizontal line test. As your explanation. If you just wrote the words horizontal line test, that would have gotten you full credit um, along with a no answer. And so the reason that the horizontal line test is a good test to tell if your function is one to one and has an inverse is because you remember an inverse curve looks like it's mirrored across the line x equals y. And so if I were to try to mirror this as best I can, it might look something like, um, and this is hard. It's harder than I thought it would be. Uh, maybe something like this. Yeah, that's actually not a bad drawing. And if this is my inverse curve, well, that is not a function because that curve fails the vertical line test. So if your original curve fails the horizontal line test, once you do that reflective symmetry for the inverse function, you know that curve you get is not going to be a function because of the vertical line test. But anyways, all your explanation needed to say was horizontal line test, and that would have been enough. In question four, it says that we, I want you to evaluate the following function at the point x equals 3. And so you'd say, which one of these two pieces is valid when x is equal to 3. And the first piece says it applies if x is less than or equal to 0, and 3 is not less than or equal to 0. Now, the second piece applies if x is greater than 0, and sort of 3 is greater than 0. So I would want to use this rule, x minus 1 cubed, 
And then whenever I plug in 3, I get 3 minus 1 cube, which is 2 cube, which is 8. Incidentally, with this question, you would have still gotten the answer 8 if you used the first piece of the function. So that's my bad for writing a... I mean, it's not a bad question. There's just... You, you could have gotten the question correct using the wrong uh, sequence of work. Right? But um, ideally, this is what you would have done for question 4. Question 5 says, uh, in the previous question, so we're talking about this one, is the function g continuous at x equals 0? And in order to answer this question, what you do is you take both the first piece and the second piece, and you plug in x equals 0. So on the first piece, uh, I would get 0 squared minus 1 is negative 1. And in the second piece of that, I would get 0 minus 1 cube, which is also minus 1. And the fact that these two pieces of the function meet up at the same value, that is what tells me that this is a continuous function. right? So I think we mentioned this in class. We said that piecewise functions can either be continuous or they might have a discontinuity when you go from the first piece to the second piece. And I want to show you what this looks like. It's important to be able to visualize this. So um, y equals x minus 1 cube. Okay. This is for x less than 1. No, 0. And this was for x greater than 0. Okay. So uh, if you were to visualize what that um, sort of looks like, that g function, um, of course it's piecewise because there's a left piece that applies whenever x is less than 0, and then there's a right piece or a second piece whenever x is greater than 0. And so this is what it looks like. I would say that this function is continuous because the left piece, or the first piece, meets up with the second piece at the same value, right? So if you were traveling along this function, the point where you go from one piece to the other is totally fine. Like you can just go roop, roop, go straight from one to the next, and you don't have to make any sort of jump. You could also very well have a function like this. Oops, that's not right. We'll leave that part alone, and I'll change this part. And if this were your piecewise function, I would say that it has a discontinuity here because there's a gap. If you were strolling along and driving along this first piece, and then you come to the point where you go from the first piece to the second piece, uh, it's not continuous. You'd have to make this jump to get from the first to the second piece. So that's how you think about it graphically, but if you're not given a graph, the way that you think about this algebraically is you say, okay, what's the handoff point in my domain, right? And the handoff point is when x is equal to 0. Because the first piece goes up to x equals 0, the next piece picks up after x equals 0. So that's where we're handing off from the first to the second piece. And then you plug that value, x equals 0, you plug that into both the first piece and the second piece to figure out where are those pieces in the vertical direction whenever x is equal to 0. And if they happen to be at the same vertical or y value, that's how you know they're meeting up. So you don't actually have to have a graph to know that the graph would be continuous. As I'm going through this test, stop me if you have any questions. We can always take a break to clarify if you're confused about one of these. Question 6. Um, says two curves are shown on the graph below and so the question says based on the appearance you know could you determine whether or not these are inverse functions and graphically the thing that tips us off and says that these would be inverse functions is are they symmetric as a reflection across the line y equals x so here's my line y equals x. Just that 
diagonal line. And sure enough, every point that's shown to us on the purple graph is a reflection of the black graph across that diagonal line. So since they have this perfect reflective symmetry, as far as we know, there's very solid evidence that these would be inverse functions. And that's why I would say uh, A is the correct choice. Yes, these are inverse functions. By the way, I put in answer choice D to see if I could catch anybody. Uh, D says F is the inverse of G, but G is not the inverse of F. This could never, ever, ever happen, right? So inverse functions, it's a symmetric type of relationship, right? Just like I may have used this example in class, like um, I have a brother and his name is Jeff. So I would say to people that Jeff is my brother and Jeff, if you were speaking, would also say to you that Drew is his brother, right? The, the relationship goes both ways. So you can never ever have this case with answer choice D. The functions have to be mutually inverse to each other. Question seven um, says, determine whether the following two functions are inverse by function composition. And so both using function composition and showing each step of your work, those were required for getting full credit for this question. If you did the, if you just took one of the functions and then you did the find the inverse procedure, like you swapped the x and the y, and then you found the inverse and then said, okay, the inverse I found isn't equal to g, I gave you half credit if you did that part correctly. Um, it took me a while to grade this question because I was trying to, like I said, give half credit to the people that used a different method, but what I wanted you to do for full credit was use function composition. And what I mean by that is if f and g are inverse, whoops, let me use a lowercase g. If f and g are inverse, then f composed with g is just equal to x and g composed with f is just equal to x. So if you wanted full credit, what I wanted to see was something like this. You could write f of g of x is equal to 1 over g of x plus 5, which would be 1 over 1 over x plus 5 plus 5. Maybe simplify that to 1 over 1 over x plus 10. And then at this point, you could point to it and say, this is not x. Right? There's no way to simplify this expression I ended up with to get what it should be. And so I'd say, no, these are not inverses after trying to compose them. So I mean by function composition. After I tried to compose them, I got something that was not x by itself. If they really were inverse functions, I could have composed the two functions and just gotten x. And so this is an important property to remember about inverse functions, um, especially if you're going to you know, go into calculus and other things past this course. Okay, so this uh, page, this page um, I thought would be an easy part of the test, but then I think a lot of people struggled and lost points here. On this page, whenever I was grading, I was a little bit picky about uh, the type of notation you used, and um, really just because all of these questions are, are just making sure that you know the vocabulary and that you know how to express things in like, you know, coordinate pairs and interval notation and things like this. So the first question is, what is the domain of this function? And the word domain means the set of all allowed inputs. So what x values are allowed? Well, my curve abruptly stops here uh, x equals negative 1. And so I can't have any x values as an input to this function that are less than negative 1. Because I just I showed you visually that the curve doesn't continue that way. 
So the domain is going to be a domain that starts at negative one, and then this little arrow on the end, this is supposed to indicate to you that this function continues off to the right and always continues to decrease, right? So this arrow pointing down over here tells me that the domain continues for every x value greater than what's shown here. And so this would have been uh, one way to get correct, you know, full credit on your answer. Another way you could have written the answer is you could have said that x is greater than or equal to negative 1 and less than plus infinity. Or, again, I would have given full credit for this answer, too, if you said x is greater than or equal to negative 1 and then just left it. So three different ways you could have written this that would have gotten full credit for question 8. Um, but again, when we're asked about the domain, we're talking about what is the set of all the allowable x values. And so never, never mention the y values or the vertical values on the graph whenever you're asked about the domain. Okay. Question nine then, similar question, but it's asking about the range of your function. And the definition of range is the set of all possible output values. And so for output values, we use the vertical axis, or we use the variable y to represent the output of our function. And again, based on what I see, and assuming that this you know little arrow down here means that it continues to decrease forever and ever, um, this set is going to be everything less than 2, right? So my graph reaches a maximum value at 2, and then it, all uh, y values below that are allowed. So the way that I would write this is the interval from negative infinity up to 2. And that would have gotten you full credit if you had written this. Or... It would have been fine if you had written uh, negative infinity less than y less than or equal to 2. Or, again, you could have written just y less than or equal to 2. And if you had written either of these three things, I would have given you full credit for the question. Right? All of those would be perfectly fine. And again, the range is only asking about the set of all possible y values. And so don't ever you know, talk about the x values or the horizontal values if you're asked about the range. Um, question 10 says, describe the intervals over which f is decreasing. And so decreasing means that as you read it from left to right, uh, decreasing means it's going down. So. I see one place where my function is going down here, and then I see another place where my function is going down over here. That first interval where it's decreasing is the interval from hold on, negative 1 to 0. And then the second interval would be the interval from, I think, 2 up to infinity. And it's important to notice that these are not coordinate pairs. These are supposed to be intervals of my x value. So this first one is saying, essentially, uh, that x can be greater than negative 1, less than 0. And the second interval notation is saying that x can be greater than 2, less than plus infinity. And either way, I would have given you full credit, whether you had written it in interval notation like this or interval notation like this. But in this type of question, whenever you're asked to describe the interval, I'm only concerned about the x interval. You don't have to tell me anything about the y values of the function. The reason for that is because knowing that a function can only have one y value for every x value, 
that means that just telling me the x values is enough to be completely specific about the region of the function we're talking about. But if you just told me y values, that's not actually enough to be specific. Because functions are allowed to have multiple x values for the same y values, right? And so if you wanted to des describe some, you know, uh, interval in terms of the y values, I wouldn't know whether you're talking about this interval or that interval, because that interval and that interval share the same y values. But they do have distinct x values. And so anytime you're asked to provide an interval, just think about x values, okay? Just think about which input values of the function satisfy whatever we're talking about, like decreasing, for example. Um, the next question says, do we have any local maxima? Local maxima means that, like, if you consider that point and all its immediate neighbors, like the, the neighboring points just to the left and just to the right of it, then that point, to be a local maxima, has to be the greatest value among its immediate neighbors. Okay, so very often it looks like a point where the function goes from increasing to decreasing. Because like right here, uh, at this point whenever I go from the function increasing to the function decreasing, it has to pass through a point that is bigger than all of its immediate neighbors. And so this is one local maximum at the point 2 comma 2. And again it's a local maximum just because it's larger than its neighbors to the left and to the right. And I would also say that this is a local maximum, negative 1, comma 1, because that point right there is also greater than its immediate neighbors. It doesn't have any neighbors to the left, but it is greater than its neighbors immediately to the right. Um, I think I was pretty... Uh, I was pretty careful. I think I still gave full credit to anybody who just listed the point 2, comma 2. Because I think before in class, I told you that a local maximum is a place where you go from increasing to decreasing. I think I said that out loud in class. And maybe I neglected to emphasize enough that at like sort of boundary points like this one, that might be a local maximum just because it's, again, greater than its local neighbors. So I gave you full credit if you only listed that point. And if you only listed this point, I think I gave you half credit for giving one out of two local maximums. Uh, the next question, do we have any local minima? And sure enough, there's one local minimum. This point right here is less than its immediate neighbors to the left and right. So that point was 0, comma 0 for the local minimum. Question 12a and b are just yes or no questions. Question 12a says, does this function have an absolute maximum? An absolute maximum means not only is it greater than its immediate neighbors to the left and right, but it's actually greater than any other value in the whole function. And that would be our point 2 comma 2. That point right there is greater than all of the other y values of the whole function. So for full credit, you just had to write the word yes. And then the next question asks, do we have an absolute minimum? That answer is no. Because any point you told me, like on the function, if you were like, oh, this point right here is a local, or sorry, <laughs> if you told me that this point right here is an absolute minimum, then I could always point to the, you know, any point just to the right of that, and it would actually be lower, right? There's no point that's the lowest point. This function continues to go down toward negative infinity. You can always find a lower point. So the answers are yes and no for those last two. Uh, question 13 says find the difference quotient. So I'm given the difference quotient formula. Didn't expect you guys to everybody have this memorized. And so here's our formula. And then if I want to use this formula, I need to figure out not only what f of x is, but also f of x plus h. And to figure out f of x plus h, I just have to replace my x with x plus h, like this. So x plus h all squared 
turns into x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 1. And then whenever I go to substitute that in here, this is going to be x squared plus 2hx plus h squared plus 1 minus f of x, which is x squared plus 1 all over h. So in the first parentheses, I've substituted in my value for f of x plus h. And in the second set of parentheses, I've substituted in my value of f of x. And the parentheses are your irk. A lot of times it's important to use parentheses whenever you make a substitution, because otherwise you might miss out on like distributing a minus sign. In this specific case, the first set of parentheses is kind of unnecessary. You don't really need them. But the second set of parentheses is really important because that tells you to distribute this minus sign to both the x squared and the plus 1. So if I just distribute the minus sign and get rid of parentheses, my next step would look like this. And I can cancel this minus 1 with the plus 1, and the x squared with the minus x squared. And I end up with 2hx plus h squared over h. Then I can cancel out an h factor in every one of my terms. And after you cancel out that h factor, you are left with 2x plus h. So the fully simplified difference quotient that would have gotten you full credit on that problem is 2x plus h. In question 14, it says, uh, sketch the curve that represents this relation. And this relation right here is what we talked about in class. This is called the general form of a line. So whatever curve you draw should actually be a relatively straight curve. <laughs> what you should have drawn is a line described by this. But suppose you didn't remember that, you know? Because, I mean, I don't always have everything memorized when I go into a test. One good test taking skill would be like, let me try to re just rearrange this and solve for y and see what happens. So let's solve for y. Uh, if I have x plus 3y plus 3 equals 0, and I want just y, I'm going to try to subtract 3 and subtract x from both sides. And on the left side, I would have 3y equals negative x minus 3. And then I'll divide both sides by 3. And then y equals negative 1 third x minus 1. And that, once I solve for y, is the slope-intercept form of a line, where my y-intercept is a negative 1, and my slope is negative 1 third. And the way you think about that, remember slope is rise over run. And so if my rise is negative 1, that means I'm going to go down one unit. And if my run is 3, then I'm going to you know, put another point here that's down 1 across 3. And then knowing that this is a line, you can connect it up and just extend it in both ways. And that would be a beautiful sketch that would get you full credit on that question. Question 15 says, I'm going to find the slope of the line that passes through these two points. And I could draw me a little picture uh, like this. 
And my x values are 1 and 3. So I'll draw three ticks out here. And then my y values are 1 and negative 2. So if I wanted to plot these two little points, I could plot one right here, the 1 comma 1. And then also the 3 comma negative 2 would be over here. My slope is going to be rise over run. And the rise here appears to be negative 3. And the run looks like I'm moving over two units. So that would be my rise over run slope. Question 16 says, find the equation of the line that passes through these two points. And they're the same points as before. So I've actually already found the slope of this line. And all that's left to find is really the intercept. Um, the trick to question 16, like some of the examples we worked the other week, is to start off by doing a point slope form, which looks like this. And for y1 and x1, you could choose either of those two points. You could choose the 1 comma 1 point, or you could choose the 3 comma negative 2 point. I'm going to choose the 1 comma 1 point, substitute in my slope here. And for this point, the x value is 1, the y value is 1, so that's why I put y minus 1 and x minus 1 into that equation. And if I were to distribute this negative 3 halves and then add plus 1 to both sides. You rearrange this to find y equals negative 3 halves x um, plus 3 halves minus 1 is uh, plus half. Oh, hold on. I might have graded this problem wrong then. I'm going to have to look at my answer key <laughs> because, oh, no, 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 okay, I made a mistake here. What mistake did I make? I was trying to do too many things at once. So let's take this one step at a time. I'm going to leave this y minus 1, and I'm going to distribute this negative 3 halves x. So. Let me be a little bit more careful. Negative 3 halves x. And then the negative 3 halves times negative 1 makes plus 3 halves like that. Now to get y by itself, I add 1 to both sides. And actually solving this correctly, I get negative 3 halves x. And then 3 halves plus 1 makes 5 halves. And I think I did grade this correctly. Sorry, I think I just momentarily tried to subtract one instead of add one. But anyways, over there in the box, that is the answer that would get you full credit for this question. That is the slope-intercept form of the line that passes through those two points. In question 17, I'm telling you that the graph on the left has a curve representing this function. So this graph over here is the graph of y equals cube root of x. And on the, on the plane over here on the right, the one that I left blank, I asked you to draw the curve that represents this function. And there's two changes I made. The first change is in my argument, I added two. And that plus 2 added to the argument tells me that I'm going to move left two units. So just take the whole graph and then move it over to the left. The minus out in front, whenever I multiply the whole thing by a negative, that tells me to reflect across the x-axis. And so taking this blue curve, moving it to the left two units, would look like this. Right? 
But I'm not done yet. I also have to reflect across the x-axis. And so if I take the, each point along that blue, sorry, each point along the green curve and I reflect it across the x-axis, now my final curve, my final answer is going to look something like this. So if you drew anything that passed through the x-intercept negative 2 and then was like sort of like decreasing like that, I gave you full credit for this orange curve. Over the x axis, I don't know what, what I was thinking. Like, I was trying to, I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like, I knew the transformation, I knew what I was supposed to do, but since, um, like, the line already, like, goes like, across the x axis, mm -hmm. I was just like, oh, do I have to flip it again? You know what I mean? So, like, I, I yeah, yeah, no, think about it just point-wise. Like, you can, you can look at just any single point along the, the green curve and then think, what if instead of that were a positive y value, it were the same value but also negative, and then you could plot it point by point, and you can just, I don't know, if that helps you thinking about it. Okay, 18, 19, and 20. Very close to the end here. Question 18 says, given these two functions, I want to find f times g. So notice that little bullet point um, is multiplying. So I read it f times g, and that tells me to multiply. So I'm going to write f times g of x. And heck, I could rewrite this as f of x, right? times g of x and then substitute in f of x is 1 over x plus 1 and g of x is x squared plus 2x. Now for me if I'm multiplying two expressions that have two terms each I'm going to draw me a box that looks like that Across the top, I'll write 1 over x plus 1, and then on the side, I'm going to write x squared plus 2x. So those are the two factors that I'm multiplying. In the top left, x squared times 1 over x is just going to leave me with an x. In the top right, 1x squared is just x squared. Over here in the bottom left, 2x times 1 over x is just 2 and then 1 times 2x is 2x. So then to write my final answer I just have to add all of those boxes up. I can write x plus x squared plus 2 plus 2x and then if I collect like terms I have an x plus a 2x so that's x squared plus 3x plus 2. And that is your answer for full credit. That's what I mean by expand and simplify. In question 19, hopefully I warned you about this sufficiently, but the times and the composition look very similar. But that little hollow ring tells me to compose the two functions. And so, switch colors real quick. If I have g ring f of x, you could write that g of f of x. That's the right way to interpret that symbol. And so writing g of f of x just means I write my g function, but then I replace the x's with f of x. So I could write f of x all squared plus 1 because my g function is x squared plus 1 and then my f of x function is x squared minus 3 so I have that squared plus 1 and again whenever I'm squaring that maybe to be very careful I draw a little box over here 
And on the top, I'm going to write x cubed minus 3. And I'm squaring that, so I'm going to multiply that times itself. So on the side, I write x squared minus 3. And in the top left, I'm going to end up with x to the fourth. Over here on the diagonals, I'm going to write negative 3x squared. And then negative 3 times negative 3 gives me positive 9. So that squared is going to be equal to adding up those boxes. I have x to the fourth minus 3x squared minus 3x squared plus 9 plus 1. And so combining like terms gives me this answer uh, plus 10. So that would have gotten you the full credit. Which brings us to our very last one in question 20. We uh, want to find the inverse. So rather than write f of x, maybe I'll just replace that with a y. And then I can write x equals y minus 1 over y plus 2 because our first step is going to be swapping the x's and the y's. And then all that's left to do at this point is just to solve for y. And solving for y, I'm going to say multiply both sides times my denominator, y plus 2. So on the left side, I'll have x times y plus 2. And on the right side, I'll just have y minus 1. Now I want to distribute the x, and so I'll end up with xy plus 2x equals y minus 1. And at this point, I want to collect all of my terms that have a y factor. I want to put those on the left side of the equation. And then all of my terms that don't have a y, I want to move those to the right side of the equation. And so on the left side, I'll keep that xy, and I'm going to subtract this y from the right side to move it over to the left side. And on the right side of the equation, I'll still have the minus 1. And then I'm also going to subtract 2x from both sides. So that now I've collected my y terms on the left and my other terms on the right. I can factor out a y now from the left side, because both of those terms have a y. And I'll be left with y times x minus 1. And if you're unsure at that step, you can try to look and see, what if I distributed the y? If I distributed the y across the parentheses, I'd end up with xy minus 1y. And so you can see how I got from that to that. The final step solving for y is going to be dividing both sides now by x minus 1. So y is equal to negative 1 minus 2x divided by x minus 1. So I'm going to take a pause and ask you guys, do you have any, any questions at all about this exam? Is there anything that you're still concerned about after seeing the solution. So we can we can take the time today and go back over it. I think we can have a fraction. Or like when we sell like one over x and computer. Okay. Yeah, like uh this may have been a, a slightly difficult problem. Right? Question eighteen. Like Going through the solution, I kind of glossed over it, but whenever I say that x squared times 1 over x is x, what I'm doing in my head is this. I'm saying x squared is the same thing as x squared divided by 1. And then 
to multiply those two fractions, I multiply across in the numerator. So x squared times 1 is x squared, and 1 times x is x. And then since x squared is x times x, and I'm dividing by x, I can cancel out one of the x's, and then I just get x. But I can definitely see how that could be a point in this exam that tripped people up, you know. Because just looking at this, just looking at x squared times 1 over x, maybe it, that's not immediately apparent that that would be an x. But um, I guess it always helps to like slow down and sometimes take little mini problems out of the big problem, put those off to the side, or maybe on a scratch piece of paper if you have it, and then like work it out separately like that.